What I will be doing primarily is reading from uh, my memoir, <coughs> and it's a book essentially about uh, my childhood and adolescence in the Jewish district of Montreal, virtually a ghetto as much as you know, the ghetto in uh, Łódź or Vilna or Krakow was a ghetto. The, the, the street that I grew up in, in for, for example, uh, had one non-Jewish family. The high school I went to with 1,100 pupils had no more than half a dozen kids who weren't Jewish. Uh, and it's called Sto Stone in My Shoe in Search of Neighborhood. So on the one hand, it's about growing up growing up Jewish, but it's also an exploration of uh, the immigrant experience. And at the end, I think, an, ex an exploration of what we mean when we use the term neighborhood, uh, when we think of community, belonging, uh, uh, how one connects in the modern world. Um, I'm, I'm traveling with that book, and I'm also traveling with Evelyn's last manuscript, uh, called Teaching Arabs Writing Self. Evelyn uh, had Lebanese parents. And it's essentially um, an, an Arab-American woman's view of the world as, uh, as an adolescent, as, uh, as an adult, a professional. Evelyn had Fulbright's teaching in Damascus and in Beirut and taught in Bahrain on a couple of occasions. Um, and these were the last two things we did together, actually. Uh, we lived, to, lived together, worked together for 32 years. Eva was not only a superb writer, she was a superb editor, and, and I really benefited from that. So, uh, let me start with the poem, and uh, uh, I'll read a section of my memoir, and Kate will read a section of <coughs> Evelyn's, and so on, and probably finish with a poem. Michael, you've probably heard this many, many times. It's a poem I generally read when I do a reading. You probably think of me as a one poem poet. It's called Night Train as I've Read, and it's a poem that started for me when I was on a night train from Paris to Zagreb in one of those typical European <coughs> train compartments with six couchettes, six sleeping areas one of which was occupied by a woman with a missing forearm. And I remember when I was told about how that had come to pass, uh, I remember being horrified um, and very much wanting to write something about it. But as often happens in a situation like that, the, the experience is so overwhelming that, that nothing, nothing appears on the page. And I keep revisiting the experience. It was a haunting experience from time to time, but with the same empty result. And when, when it finally came to me, about eight years later, it came strangely enough in one sitting. Usually I have to peck away at a poem before it finally emerges. But the strange thing was, after that lapse of several years, the details of the, uh, the event as they had originally been related to me had become muddy. I couldn't remember, for example, whether the woman was a Serb who had lost her limb as a result of a Croatian raid on her village, or the reverse. And it bothers the speaker, the narrator, who keeps asking questions like, was it here, was it there, was it this, was it that? Questions not nearly as fundamental as the issue of the violence, the question of the violence, the mindlessness of the violence. So much so that the means of rendering it in this poem language in the largest sense, down to the, uh, you know, the nuts and bowls, bowls and screws of language, vowels, consonants, decompose, drift away, as if to suggest that language lacks the capacity to render such an experience. The explanation is longer than the poem. <laughs> Night train to Zagreb. When gusts spread against the glass on the Orient Express to Zagreb, snow separates in alphabet. The vowels clinging to glass, consonants slipping into drifts. 
It must be this way for the howl to flatten a summons against the pain, the moaning against the arms of night, pushing it beneath unbroken meters of the train. <clears throat> Inside, one hand reaches for coffee, the other sleeve reaches the table, armless, turning in circles like a pendulum raising questions as the train turns through the foothills. It was a Serb, or was any Croat, who came out of a night like this with candles to something in a bag. And she was there, something between the doorway and road, or was it the bedroom and kitchen? And he lowered to her as if to leave something behind, a kiss or something more memorable. We always misunderstand, and her arm was in the snow. Possibly on a night like this, with less to understand than ice caking on glass over a broken tooth moan in alphabet that never shakes. I am moving fast backward through photo albums, letters opened 60 years ago, Stumbling towards the Montreal I once glided through with imaginary skates. Mounting at age five the steep wooden stairs of Mount Royal Elementary School. Only the name had a touch of nobility. Eventually crossing the frontier of Rachel Street to Baron Bing High. Carried by wind through the ice-walled air, the bearded face of my grandfather descends in a portrait, thundering in silence. Parents and aunts and uncles and cousins follow. Behind them the turbulence of town and shtetl, sometimes in carts rattling over wheel ruts in cobblestone, sometimes like gulls carried noiselessly on currents of air, or like one mass of flotsam and jetsam steaming across the Atlantic. Bobbing in their wake, matzo balls and the mysterious sounds of the Torah Intoned by young boys around long tables with slender fingers and hair finer than mica. They all surface like dolphins scrambling over boulders across the sandbar of a new continent. Some dropping from steerage into strange harbors, swimming like my uncles Meyer and Rudolph to shore. Once there, the bewildered shake the journey from their clothes, the coal dust from the engine room, the cramp from steerage, or for the more affluent, cake crumbs from the main dining room. And look around, studying the movement of the natives, the Anglos, Francophones, Latinos of the Americas, while following the wisdom of their own hands, sewing cloth, shoveling coal, hammering tin. Overhead, the stars turn like a merry-go-round as a tidal wave of Jews spreads across the plateau a crop extending like acres and acres of wheat or soybeans or corn, without variation, it seems, until we discover that the new arrivals aren't all the same. Some have beards, broad-brimmed hats, and chant prayers with the fervor intended to draw heaven to earth. And others, earlier arrivals, are Christian, who, the not part of our play, announced themselves in neon lights among the Jewish shops on St. Lawrence Boulevard. Sinclair's, which runs Katz's Button Shop and Panya Moshku's Grocery, as though a truce has been declared. These were the syllables in our atlas, the sights that passed us as we passed our hands over the sandpaper roughness of the lumberyard's concrete wall, the glass front of Schwartz's delicatessen. Within our borders, we shuffled up and down stairs, scuffed corridors for 11 years under the arched eyes of teachers, who from a distance were one massive authority, but close up broke down the categories of shape, size, and ideology. We grew into the school the way one grows into a suit of clothes passed on by an older brother. Familiar, comfortable. Less comfortable was the rabbinical training that waited for us as the sun darkened at the end of each school day. The shtetls our parents had left thousands of miles to the east 
reemerged as we approached the age of 13 and trudged towards manhood by climbing the stairs to the second story of a flat two blocks down Clark Street next to a synagogue. Across the threshold, monitored by the squint of the rabbi's wife, we turned into a room dominated by a long table and a dozen or so adolescent heads with skull caps. The scene smacked of the illicit, like the basement of a church school on Santorini where the clergy practiced sedition for years by teaching Greek under the eyes of the occupying Turks. Inevitably, we left high school in our ghetto, a handful of blocks in each direction, never fully understanding the social laws that signaled the time for our departure. But, like it or not, we were hatched, ready to integrate into that other world. Each of us needed something to draw us out, to take those first tentative steps from the radiant heat of familiar paths to the professions. For some it was engineering, watching numbers cascade into the girders of buildings. For others it was teasing the law into conceptions of fair play. For several it was science, hovering over a microscope, discovering miniature worlds. For me it was the mysteries of language that, unbeknown to me, had begun to attach themselves to the chatter around the family's festive meals, to the strange shapes of Hebrew characters, to the spiral-stared houses on my path to school until the music slowed and the dance stopped and the lights went out and it all ended and I left that ghetto for McGill University only half a mile west, but further than I could imagine. Now, Kate is going to read uh, first from uh, one of uh, Evelyn's early essays. It's called 13 Takes on Growing Up Arab American. She's going to read one, uh, one of the middle sections and then a couple of sections towards the end. Best fishing buddy was Mr. Rosenfield who sold silk ties and held his pants up with suspenders. Before dawn on a Saturday, his black Pontiac would drive down our street, and my father, who'd been at the window watching for headlights, would flick off the porch light and be out the door. Gear loaded, the two were off for the day, out after white perch and striped bass, fresh water fish, forget the sea. Cape Cod had 365 bodies of water, my father claimed, a new one for each day of the year. When they arrived at their special spot, the sun just rising, the morning mist still on the lake, they spread out along the shore in opposite directions. Mirror images, clumsy figures in waist-high fishermen's boots wading cautiously into the water. Product of shtetl or mountain, Neither man knew how to swim, but they knew rule number one. Don't talk, don't call out, don't scare the fish. At noon, under a fringe of trees, they unrolled a patchwork blanket of wool remnants my mother had pieced together on her sewing machine, pulled out sandwiches wrapped in wax paper, fried eggplant for my father, something that smelled of fish for Mr. Rosenfield. Hard-boiled eggs, whole tomatoes they bit into like apples, thermoses of sweetened black coffee, cinnamon buns picked up the day before from a favourite bakery. Afterwards, my father puffing on his pipe, Mr Rosenfield his cigarette, they relaxed into conversation. What did they talk about then, this Arab and this Jew? Rods and reels maybe, lures and live bait, Irish politicians. In April that year, my mother rented a storefront a quarter mile from school and installed two banks of sewing machines, some Singer, some Wilcox and Gibbs, all second hand. She was going into business for herself, just like a man. Equipment in place, my mother looked to manufacturers downtown who would contract work to her. <coughs> the earliest and steadiest source was Mr. Lerner, whose clothing line was Debbie Lou, 
his daughter's name. Jews are like us, my mother said. They love their children. Every so often on his way home from the city, Mr. Lerner dropped by our house. My mother, flustered by the novelty of a guest who wasn't family, directed him to the best chair in the parlour and brought out the Canadian club, offering it neat or with a splash of water. But as she knew, he was there on business. A new style of bathrobe or of pedal pushers to be laid out on the coffee table and its price haggled over. With the sample garment turned inside out and back again, she would tick off what it required by way of zipper, pockets, darts or lining. A lot of work, she'd finally say. She didn't know. Could she turn a profit? She had left Lebanon at 12, manned textile looms at 14, and been a worker all her life. Now she was a boss and desperate to succeed. Mr. Lerner would set down his glass and rub his knees. Look at it my way, Mrs. I also have to eat. Eventually, they'd agree on maybe 15 more cents per garment. Only time would tell if she'd been outmaneuvered. For now, courtesy dictated she bring out her fancy sweets and brew a pot of coffee. Later in her shop, she'd go through the same dance with her workers. A lot to this new style, they'd say. It's complicated. Setting in this collar will be tricky. Seven more cents. That's all? Ladies, look at it my way. On my first trip to Lebanon, I changed planes in Paris. At Orly, I was already seated and strapped in when passengers were instructed to disembark. In the afternoon sun, our luggage had been lined up on the tarmac and each of us stepped forward to identify our bags. Then we were herded back on board. I trooped on with the others, although I knew the plane was going to crash. Disaster! Mayhem! How had I forgotten? This was what the Middle East was all about. I'd wanted this trip for the adventure and to see my parents' homeland. Times had changed. Black was beautiful. Exotic was in. The melting pot was yesterday's thinking. But I'd been apprehensive from the start and met with a psychiatrist to talk it out. He didn't understand. Four hours from Paris to Beirut. I figured the bomb was scheduled to explode midway. The next morning, I sat on the terrace of the Hotel Melkart, named after the ancient king of the underworld and protector of the universe. Drinking in the scents of jasmine and white gardenia, nursing a demi-tasse of sweet Turkish coffee. In the distance ahead, gulls rode the sea breezes like a roller coaster. Below them, in a dazzle of sunlight, the blue-green Mediterranean kept onto the horizon. Ghost ships passed, silhouetted against the blue pale sky. High-proud Phoenician vessels ploughing their way from Byblos, Beirut, Tyra, Sidon, Voyaging to North Africa, on through the Straits, into open, unknown waters. And steamships, travelling in their wake, carrying my parents and my grandparents. Later in the morning, I would find a driver to take me to my mother's village, where my aunt was waiting. And, on another day, inland to Zale. You're going home! My mother had said it like a promise. Time would tell, I thought, for now it was enough to have leapt borders and landed safely, to perch for this half hour on this threshold, anonymous, unclaimed, and hostage only to my own imaginings. I have seldom been so content. My first admirer was Robert Hope, the class show-off who swallowed ants, flies, and anything else the other kids fed him, and whose lips were always blue from sucking on inky scraps of composition paper. He'd yank my thick pigtails when I wasn't looking, and chase me home from school each day, careful never to catch me, because what would he do with me then? Once, though, in a fit of malice, he got up close enough to swipe at my arm and made me spill a stack of Christmas cards our teacher, Mr. Carp, had given me to mail. Envelopes upside down in the snow, white on white. I couldn't be sure I'd retrieve them all. 
Mr. Cart would be very angry and he would blame me. When I tried to tell him about it the next day, I was so nervous I couldn't think of the word I. Me dropped your letters, I said. When I reached the fifth grade, Ernest Donnarumma, who lived in a fancy brick house on the West Roxbury Parkway, said I would go, would I go to the movies with him, then pinned me against a lamppost outside the schoolyard and pushed his face in close to kiss me. When I hollered and scratched him, he backed off in a hurry. After that, I wasn't sure the invitation was still open, but I liked Ernest, so I thought I'd just mention it to my mother. She kept saying, what, what? And that my father had better not hear about this. She hadn't taken that well, I thought. So I never told her about Edward Dunn, the new boy in class that my best friend Ruth and I tailed home one day, not knowing what else to do when we liked a boy. Ruth's parents were sober-faced Methodists, her father superintendent of the Sunday school. Mine were Arabs who sent me out of the room whenever adult conversation threatened to take an interesting turn. Prissy and smug, Ruth and I made the mistake of hanging out with each other instead of with a C-plus run of girls who were busily piecing together the facts of life. When I finally got wind of how things were, I wanted to be sure, and I was mad. Why should everyone know but me? I found my mother upstairs in my bedroom, putting new white sheets on my bed. I want you to tell me where babies come from, I screamed, and I made her do it. In two clip sentences, which was all she could manage, she diagrammed the mechanics of sex. So it was true. It was awful. You just have to put up with it, she said, smoothing out the last wrinkle. It doesn't take long. And yet, when I got my first period, she was all smiles, only astonished that I didn't know what was happening to me. Hadn't I heard girls talk? And no dire warnings about boys, no curfews ever, or rules about where I could go or friends I could go with. What awful things does it say about me that she trusted me so? No dates either, of course. I didn't much care, except maybe when I missed my senior prom. But since I went to an all-girls school, I would have had to do the asking. And though I fantasized all the time about boys, there was no flesh and blood specimen I could think of to be seen with. So my high school years passed without our ever having it out. Once I got away to college, my parents couldn't stop me from dating, the little bit that I did date. They just looked the other way and trusted that once I put my mind to it, I would meet some honorable young man from a good Arab family and marry him. But no hurry about that. Meanwhile, there was Steve, the handsome wasp I dated for most of my junior year. How did you land him? asked a friend I never forgave. Once when I was home for the weekend, he picked me up and drove me back to campus. And then a couple of times, he dropped by the house when I wasn't there, thinking he could charm my parents into liking him. They were always polite, would not have known how to be otherwise, but they must have wondered who was this blonde outlander and what did he want from them? Surely not their daughter. That spring break, Steve came by the house again and went out somewhere. A party, a movie, bowling, I don't remember, and then came back late parked the old VW bug down the street and made out for an hour. At one point, the neighborhood cop walking his beat stopped to peer into the car, but when he saw it was only me, he smiled and moved on. My mother met me at the door, beside herself with fury, and I suppose with panic. Where had I been? Wretch that I was, what had I been doing? She would not let me go to bed until I told. There was so little to tell, but even that little would have been too much for her, it had been a late party, a movie or string, I said. What was the problem? She scared me that night. I'd been pretending to myself that I could go and come as I pleased. I'd forgotten that she would never forget the village culture in her bones, the dread of being shamed, never able to marry off your children or visit your neighbor, the misery of having everyone look at you as if you had ceased to exist or were less than the dirt under their feet. Born in the 19th century and into another world, old enough to be my grandmother, she did her best. And I learned to do my part, lying and leading a double life. Anything 
rather than rouse again that killing rage. My shoe <coughs> is set in the Montreal that I grew up in, but there are a couple of sections that deal with uh, our Laurentian escapes. Laurentian is a gentle mountain chain north of Montreal where factory workers, basically what people did in that part of town, uh, would spend a couple of weeks uh, drive their families up. Uh, especially in the late 40s, early 50s, when there was a lot of polio around, the idea was to get your kids out of the city. So this is called Laurentians, and it follows a section on my elementary school, uh, which is not one of the happiest times of my life, anything but magical. So we start by saying, magic did not happen at Mount Royal School. But when classes laid out in June and the family drove 30 miles into the Laurentians, it was as unmistakable as a visiting circus. For two months, we would become part of Montreal's transplanted population. We'd set off our cars, our car packed with clothes, pots and pans, until finally, no room was left except for a narrow space on top of blankets and pillows, which my brother and I wedged ourselves into. What the long line of autos passed could only be described as haphazard. A general store close to the road, its owner in a straw hat nodding at the traffic stopped at a light, a two-story house with porches upstairs and down beside an empty lot with stacked cords of wood, and further from town, fields with shoots of corn that would be harvested in the fall for cattle feed. After a few miles, when Montreal's tallest buildings had disappeared from the rearview mirror, the highway Route 11 continued north on to Valmorin, Val David, and Prefontaine, where many of those autos unloaded their passengers. My first trip to the Laurentians, and several thereafter, was not to Prefontaine, but to the foothills, in Farmer Leblanc's fields in Lesage, by a river where summer renters swam and fished. That was where I saw for the first time a world entirely different from the brick and stone structures that I passed from September to June. As soon as I stepped into the open air, I smelled the farmyard. Cows, chickens, and pigs, the stacked hay, the rich manure that filled the air from the neighboring barn by the paved highway and carried across fields into a wood. Here, for the first time, I was charmed by the supercilious stare of cows, by the way chickens shed their warmth along paths that they created. I accepted their mooing and clucking as language to be taken seriously. The openness of the fields, the orchestra of barnyard sounds and nocturnal chat of cicadas spoke to me of endlessness. No teachers, no books only pastures to gaze at or games to play with other children until we were all covered in darkness. For two months, I careened through a world of laughter and shouting with no parental referees. It was as though they'd ceased to exist. And I find it ironic now to stare at the only photo I have of those days, not a snapshot of the wonderful chaos of play, but a family photo taken on the weekend when my father came from hammering out the dents in cars in order to plunge into the North River and store up sun for the coming week. The farm provided its own surprises whenever our play became too predictable. Kick the can was our daily game, a variation on hide and seek, but with the added pleasure of kicking an empty tin can into improbable shapes and improbable places. One day, the tin landed in brush, where Mr. LeBlanc had laid a trap in order to put an end to the nightly assault of skunks on his chickens. Finally, one of the traps snapped shut. Robert, the farmer's son, was young enough to love animals, but not old enough to shy away from a sleek furry creature. As he stooped to pat it, the skunk did what skunks do. Though Robert was bathed repeatedly for the rest of the summer, none of us would play with him. As for the skunk, the farmer ended its career with one blow of a bow across its head. 
Mr. LeBlanc had no ducks or geese, but he did keep a couple of pigs whose tenancy turned out to be brief. Shadowing my idyllic memories of the farm was a late August ritual which brought the farmer's brother and grown nephew from a neighboring town. On that day, the pig selected from the, for the occasion departed from its habit of snuffing around the barn for slops. It fidgeted, tried to move away from the humans approaching. Before long, the farmer and his brother had trussed the pig's legs while the other members of the family held the pig on its back. As the LeBlanc family hovered like a team of surgeons, it responded with squeals which were as close to a human sound as I've ever heard coming from an animal. That was the last we heard before its throat was slit. Not long after that, perhaps two or three days, our family car was packed again. My brother and I wedged in our places and pointed toward Clark Street. Somehow it was fitting that the summer ended with that porcine dirge. It was our way of learning that even summer idols come to an end and that the days of summer finally have their nightfalls and their frosts. Paperman's funeral parlor was barely visible from our rear balcony on Clark Street. But from time to time, I made out its hearses moving slowly along St. Durban Street, past the synagogue, to cemeteries on the outskirts of the city. A sonority in the air, the iconography of death, but not death itself. The death of a classmate, Ben Ami Hill, in the second grade brought the event closer. Over the years, he has dimmed in memory to an oval face whose features I cannot make out. He died from tuberculosis at a time when other sufferers were sent to a sanatorium outside St. Agath for a mountain cure. As far as I was concerned, it was not as though something cataclysmic had happened. He was absent one day, then another. No one answered when his name was called, and then it wasn't. He simply disappeared. But that pig, a distinct grunting presence for every day of two months, squealing to its last moments, brought a whole shudder and curtain-closing finality to life as I returned to Mount Royal's classrooms for further instruction. It strikes me that this is a good stopping point. Uh, it's a read a poem and heard some passages from Evelyn's work, some of mine. I imagine some of you are writers, at least all students of literature. Um, I don't know whether you're involved in any what is called life writing, I mean whether you're, you're keeping journals or, or thinking about um, autobiography, biography. I was speaking to one individual here who mentioned that she was interested in writing and fantasy was what interested her or appealed to her. Um, any thoughts at all? Um, I've actually like, tried a bit of life writing, but it seems a bit... Um, I feel like there's a responsibility not to re misrepresent people mm. with that you don't have when you're... That's an issue, fantasy. actually. That is an issue. Um, Evelyn, uh, before writing this, the, uh, Evelyn died in... 2010, this was published recently. Um, she uh, wrote a collection of short stories. Actually, a lot of the characters are her relatives and it just hardly disguised at all. Um, I had this issue come up just talking about my high school days and teachers that um, carried some moment in my life. I, I identify them. On the other hand, there are teachers that, um, um, how can I be charitable here? <laughs> oh, I, I, I misread it. I simply gave them another name, basically. Although it's very interesting, I did, I, the, the, the launch in Montreal was uh, at the Jewish Public Library, and it inaugurated a museum devoted to my old high school. So there's a huge crowd people who went to that high school. And it, 
I was talking about the woman who taught drama, and I call her Miss Kadish, uh, since the likelihood of, you, know, you will never meet her. Her name was Miss Katz. Of course, everyone in the audience knew who I was talking about. Um, and I, I, I always, uh, she, she basically would come in with a rag bag of ethnic jokes that she picked up from you know, Sunday radio. Uh, and and uh, it, it was like indulging some dotty aunt or grandmother. And, uh, so, But the individual who, was, uh, who, who did the introduction or hosted the event, I think was offended because he really liked her. He thought she was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't argue with him. Um, you know, it, 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 I think you raise a more profound problem, though, because you know there are times when we deliberately make changes. Um, I mean, let us say you're describing you, you 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 want you want you want something to emerge. And you rearrange a landscape because it leaves you with a particular feeling, which which sorts with the action that you're trying to that you're trying to convey. Um, and then again, memory fails. I, the, I, the, I, I remember chatting with my brother after all we shared a set of parents and uh, high school experiences and so on, and I found this. Fascinating. Um, I, I mean, I've always remembered that he he, he, he likes to reinvent, uh, especially where he's one of the figures in the episode. And, and uh, I found that I, I simply couldn't rely on him at all. But then, uh, so by, by implication, I'm saying I'm relying. I was relying on my own memory. But I'm sure that that there are there there are times where, matter of fact, I've had some. Uh, uh, some former buddies say, you know, it's not the way I remember it. And who knows, they may be right. It's, uh, you do not want to be in a position of uh, presenting something like this as fiction because it isn't and so on. And, and I, you know, I think you're writing with a desire to recapture the past and, and to, uh, and clearly you're looking at the past not merely as a, as a sequence of events that don't relate to one another, but I mean you see some patterns, some significant, uh, some significance, something that's a picture on the wall, and and and, um, and and memory is basically the thing you go. I, I did, however, in this case, as much as possible, work with facts, records, photographs. Uh, I'll be going to Hull tomorrow, and there's a gentleman who teaches there, uh, who's an expert on immigration, and he put me onto websites uh, so that I was able to track my mother's journey. I had interviewed her, and she remembered um, uh, taking a horse and wagon with her mother from her town, Gora Kalvaria, to Warsaw, but distance of 25 miles. She had a blurry memory of a train ride from Warsaw to the coast to Danzig, Gdansk. Uh, then, um, with the help of uh, Nicholas Evans, um, I located her boat, uh, the Orlando, and actually was able to trace its passage through the Kaiser Wilhelm Canal, the Kiel Canal. And I was able to get onto newspapers and find out what the weather conditions were. She remembered being seasick and went up through the Dogger Bank, just west of Denmark, a little shallow, the water would have been very rough, and um, uh, Nick, Nick Evans also filled in what she would have experienced as the boat approached the English coast, the, uh, the, the owners of the fish factories off, off Grimsby, basically, where the boat waited for high tide so it could pull into the Albert docks and Hull. And, I mean, and he mapped out the trip she took from Hull to Liverpool, what she would have seen, the towns and cities that she went through. So, but even then, I mean, I was, I was working with two pieces. I had her interview, very impressionistic. She was a child, she was 12 years old. Uh, and, and I had all those records. Um, 
but I, she did remember, she, she, there was something she remembered vividly. She remembered being served soup, which sort of sloshed from side to side. And when you're going like this in a boat, of course, that just makes your stomach a little more queasy. And she remembered uh, the steward, who sort of took pity on this young passenger, bringing her a huge orange. And, um, and I have her basically with this orange in her hand as she lands and she disembarks, kind of a symbol of the world that was to come. So, you know, there's, um, uh, it, you know, it's a matter of taking the root systems that are there, basically, that, that, that one could find in actual written records and, and, uh, and then creating a narrative out of it. Yeah. Um, do you think the experience of writing a me memoir is the same or similar in older age or youth or middle age? I mean, obviously apart from the quantity of years to refer to. Two good questions. The first one is easy to answer because there's a very specific answer. I would n not have never written this, this, this memoir, but for a particular circumstance. Uh, Evelyn and I would periodically go to a writer's colony. They have lots of these in the States. They have some in the UK as well, I understand. And uh, when we went to was in Virginia, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. It houses writers and painters and composers, sculptors, photographers, etc. Feeds them, gives them studios to work in. And uh, we often went down together. And uh, you work in separate studios, and the understanding is you don't disturb one another. And I had uh, just I came down basically to put this manuscript together and sent it off to the publisher. We had a six-week stay, and after three weeks, I mailed the manuscript off, and uh, I was done with nothing else to do. And uh, I mean, I, I really didn't want to bother uh, Evelyn incessantly, uh, and I think finally out of exasperation, she said, well, why don't you write about Montreal? She said, you're always talking about it, and so on. And it, 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 it never occurred to me that that was something that I might want to do. I've, I've not really done any serious prose except for three quarters of a novel many, many, many years ago, uh, which was quite bad. Not as bad as a play that I tried previously. Um, I think I would like to try a novel now, as a matter of fact. I mean, I, there's so many uh, links in, in writing in poems and novels, speaker, speaker, narrative voice, and so on. In any event, uh, I started looking through photos and uh, just actually thinking about it and, and trying to break a memoir up into uh, parts that were significant in my life. As I was doing that, uh, the focal points changed somewhat. I don't think I realized what I was doing until I'd done most of it. So at first it was a memoir about growing up in Jewish Montreal, largely myself and my family. Um, as it turns out, I think myself and my family are prototypical figures. Um, I mean, these people are immigrants basically, any immigrants, any ethnic group. Um, and then it becomes the, the larger issue, basically, living in a neighborhood, um, living in that kind of neighborhood, which is rapidly disappearing from North America. Do you know Boston at all? No. There's, um, I mean, Montreal, you really had distinct ethnic neighborhoods, as you did in New York. Um, I moved down to Boston latish in the 60s, but there was still an Italian district, and it was densely Italian. Not so now. Also South Boston, densely Irish, not so now. Um, and uh, what we've had, a demographic, uh, one can almost describe them as demographic nightmares, these high-rise slums that you get in the Bronx, you know, people just almost fastened together by some strange adhesive which makes them hate one another and commit acts of violence towards one another. And also, the death of the suburbs places that are separated by a couple of hundred yards so that people don't see one another. I, I, I think of the extreme of that as sections of Los Angeles where you see cars moving down motorways and so you do not see people in the streets. 
And I think of growing up on those Montreal streets with our parents sitting in the front porches, gossiping over the front porches. There were masses of kids playing in the streets and so on. And, uh, and there was a wonderful energy to it. I, I, I just feel that I had a glorious growing up, a glorious childhood. Um, I think that uh, uh, people who don't have that experience, I think, lack some. Your second question was um, recollection in different stages of one's life, right? Yeah, whether the impulse to write a memoir yeah. can be the same. Or it's so, yeah, so it's, you know, in, in my specific case, I mean, the answer was, I mean, I, I would not have written that memoir if Evelyn had not prodded me, and I realized that there was stuff there and, um, and it was something to work with. And I like having a project that takes time while I'm doing shorter poems. It, it, uh, uh, so that was helpful. Um, what sort of a memoir would I have written, would I have written uh, 40 years ago? Hard to say, hard to say. Uh, my interests would have been different, clearly. Um, I don't think, I think I would have come to a different sense of synthesis. I don't think the issue, the whole issue of neighborhood would have been so important for me. I mean, at that point in my life, I was, I was just wandering. I mean, one day I was doing, I started graduate work at McGill and I, I asked myself what the hell I was doing there. I couldn't give myself a satisfactory answer. The next day I was, I went up to the Arctic and worked there. I told my folks that I was going to drop out of school. Um, become a poet and go up to the Arctic. I think they, they, they probably thought they got the wrong kid at the hospital. Um, That's what the folks want to hear. <laughs> but to their credit, they never tried to pressure me. And a good thing because I, was, I, I, I would have done what I wanted to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, despite this book tour now, which I'm somewhat uncomfortable with, I don't like being away for so long now, um, I kind of like staying put. So, and, and I think, I like staying put, and I think the, uh, the uh, I'm more comfortable with the energy expressing itself in a mental way, so I'm trying to understand basically what's happened in my life, what I see around me. Oh, uh, in other words, where, where my previous traveling was very largely with my feet, although I did keep diaries and so on, um, it was just, you know, it was, there was a sensuality to it. And I, I, my God, you know, going, seeing Santrofim in Nîmes or Arles, wherever it was, and the, that great Roman bridge in Rumoulin, and uh, the Mausolée of Dal in Plaza di in Ravenna. It's wonderful, just one sensual experience after another. I don't travel like that any longer. And I don't think uh, I see the world in that. George, what strikes me very strongly when you talk about your um, mother's passage to Canada and that route around the British Isles that was reconstructed yeah. and so on, um, that is very nearly all you have to go on, the soup in the bowl and so on. But it's interesting to see how very little it takes to sustain a very evocative passage of prose, because when I read that in the memoir, yeah. I thought, this is so vivid. Yeah. It's all it takes. Yeah. I, I've often thought of my German grandfather, yeah. who was taken prisoner by the Russians in the First World War and sent off to a POW camp at Astrakhan on the Caspian Sea. And after the Germans and Russians made their separate peace at the the past, he was at liberty. But there was no troop train to take him back up, of course. He walked. However, you know, that must be 2,000 miles. Mm, wow. And he, it took him a year. And because he knew that if you went north of the Black Sea, you were going through Russia, and Russia was in a turmoil of revolution, and they'd just been at war with Germany anyway, he thought, I'll avoid that. <laughs> so he walked across the Caucasus and the whole length of Turkey. 
And that is one hell of a war. Now, all I know is the fact that he did it. I know not a single thing about any place he was, anybody he met, yeah. nothing. You know? yeah. Yeah. And you think, what can you do with that? I'd love to know what I can do. I can, because I, I think about that more often than is probably sane. Because there's nowhere I can go with the thought. I, all I have is the fact that he did it. It's funny, Michael. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I interviewed my parents at Evelyn's urging, and it was such that was such wonderful advice. My father was easy to interview. He he just loved spinning yarns. My mother was very monosyllabic. You had to drag it out of her, but you don't need much. That's and I true. think like something, the image of that orange, you combine it with a seasickness. You know, you see little tidal waves of pea soup sloshing over the edges, and so on. You get four or five details like that, you can build something. Mm -hmm. But it helped, it really helped for me to have what uh, Nick Evans provided because I really could follow the weather. I mean, I could see the weather the way I could see the weather outside here now. And, and it, it, it tied in nicely. So it was almost as though the narrative had written itself. Uh, and I took what was given to me in the, um, uh, you know, with the, with the image of that orange, her, I mean, her lying there in her cabin, um, her getting up uh, maybe once or twice, crossing the ocean, uh, that, that's invented, where, you know, she just sees a gray sky and so on. I suppose I could have double checked that, probably was a gray sky. Um, if it was these latitudes, it'll do. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, no, I think it's, but it, it's, it makes it challenging, it also makes it, it makes the chore engaging, otherwise it would be mechanical. I mean, if it were just a matter of records and, uh, you know, pre presenting a brief that you were going to put forward in a, in a, in a, in a court of law, um, it doesn't have the same charm and the same kind of challenge. Well, I was just going to say, my, um, I, I, my, Granddad, um, he, he was Polish, they grew up in. Uh, Calgary is a good sized city, Lethbridge is a pretty small place. And uh, got onto a plane, it was like a ten seater, and um, kind of bent down and crawled to your seat. Anyway, got to Calgary and uh, waited for the luggage, and uh, yeah, within five minutes, the other nine people had picked up their luggage and I was standing there. And not being too broad, I stood there for another half an hour until I, I finally figured out that the luggage wasn't there. And, and uh, apparently there was not enough, not enough room for it in the flight. And I had the poems that I was going to read in my luggage. And the only poem, I, there are two poems, or maybe three poems that I know by heart. Um, and I thought, God, I mean, what I'm going to have to do in Calgary is just to read those three poems over and over and over again. <laughs> so maybe I'll read that by great to Zagreb over and over and over again. Um, okay. Frozen White. <laughs> Have you ever noticed on a day when ice cuts through wind and spears across the lake that you don't touch her? hand across the sheet, the white, full, frozen, and you don't reach across two glasses of decam, and you don't touch her reaching phrase, but let it drop into the twisted pulls of the hook rug, and you don't even stare at the fire as the cold pushes at the outside hinges and snow barrels down the roof drifting up the windows, and you don't, and you don't, and you don't. The poem is called Homecoming. Uh, it, it started for me with uh, a take on uh, so a movie, but uh, a movie on uh, Mordecai Richler's uh, the apprenticeship of Dodie Kravitz. I think the opening take, these kids in, in a 
marching band, cadets in a marching band. And it was uh, it taken a couple of blocks from where I lived in Montreal, and I, I know the school. And the poem is set in the war, and I imagine these kids looking at the film you know, in three or four years being filling out those uniforms, which, which are the, the, in the film are too large, and they're marching out of steps, step. And they will eventually, I realize, march and step and fill those uniforms basically go to the slaughterhouses of Europe. Homecoming. Whenever I saw a Harry Flap pumping notes through his tuba, the clump of them taking off like a goonie bird, plopping on his gold epaulets, and Harry hopping to keep in step in the homecoming parade, I knew the sky had opened for redemption. For all of us, for the droolers and nose pickers, even Harry, who would crawl up to heaven on all fours or get sucked up, his hair standing like a corn crop. And the band marked time, notes slipped down like an old Ford stuck in second gear, except they weren't stuck and jolted on in whites and reds as red as fire plugs until it broke up in Howard's where soda spilled over glass and everyone laughed like hussars. It was 40 or 41 when the letters came, typed up from the board, and the whole band signed up, even Harry Flat, hair rising like an expectation. And the war kissed them, even the sophisticates from Leopard Hill and Lafayette laid them down like children and spread an eternity of white crosses like corn seed in longer and longer rows, and the, blur, the birds flew north, whole flocks of them, and never stopped, not even for crumbs. One last one, and this is partly for you, Michael, so you, because you spent a lot of time at Chipon in Evelyn's Cottage, and this uh, poem is called Twin Trees at Sheep Pond. Uh, Evelyn and I did a, a lot of her work, uh, a, a lot of our work there. It, it's, um, it was a pond on Cape Cod, uh, and it had been in her family for a long while. I don't know whether you were there, Michael, before she had it redone, where the, the back wall was all glass, basically, so you were looking down at the lake. Before that, she had a, a kind of a, a little porch with mosquito netting that had holes in it and so on. It was dark and not so pleasant. Anyway, uh, whenever we went down there, we became we were aware of two trees, one coniferous, the other deciduous. Uh, and every few years or so, you'd get a siege of gypsy caterpillars, and they would really go after the leaves on the, uh, on the deciduous uh, tree. So you know, every year we'd go down there, we wondered whether the leaf-bearing tree was going to make it. Uh, so whether trees or needles, their, their initial represent, uh, re representation is as hair. Twin trees as sheep pond. Only the, oh, well, let me say one, one last thing about it. I mean, uh, the poem uh, ostensibly seems to be, out a couple, to be about a couple of trees, but I think it leans towards the issue of the things we can control in our lives and the things that we can't control. Only the hair unsettled. Only, again, only the hair unsettles us. A crew cut of needles on one declares it will survive, acquire seasons of growth, graduate, the way pines do even here on this powdery incline. The other gives us fits each fall after the caterpillar siege. When it leans over water, curling towards mortality as if seeking a transfusion of God knows what. Where water's speech glints late falls, darkening skies, and twigs bare shudder as wind guides the temperatures down. Water knows the stillness that's ahead, moves incessantly like children released from school, rushing from the reach of darkness. We'll wait on the tree to acquire its heft the way we always wait for the other child who has stared at the sky for too long and is running to catch up.
and never does. Thank you very much. Thank you.